Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of RFL. I am Richard French. Now, before I go into details about tonight's program, I want you to take a look at these pictures. You'll see here a protest, women holding signs. Now, notice the age of the women and how they're dressed, almost all of them seniors. The women you see here protesting, they're nuns. They're protesting the very church that they vowed to obey and love. Now, some say the protest is for good reason. Others say they just should quiet down and get in line. It's a story that captured national attention recently, and it's renewed a long smoldering debate over the Catholic Church, its direction, and its future. We are calling our program this evening Catholic Church at a Crossroads. Now, that's in large part because of the evidence of the church's struggles and how very real they are. Polling of Catholics shows a growing dissatisfaction, mass attendance at an all-time low, priest shortages and Catholic school closings. Then there are also the internal struggles, the sex abuse scandal, which not only tore through many close-knit parishes, but it left many unable to recover financially. And today, you have the church condemning the country's largest group of nuns, accusing them of being disloyal and pushing radical feminism. I'm talking about women who took vows of chastity, poverty, and obedience to God. Women whose life's mission is to serve the poor and the sick. Now I should note here, as a practicing Roman Catholic myself, I am asking, as many of you probably are, what is happening to the state of our Catholic Church? Now I have a deep, heartfelt devotion to the Church, and I believe in the value of a Catholic education. My children even attend one. But I do have some real worries here, especially when I see school shuttering, a shortage of priests, and the church going after a group of nuns. That's a taste of what we have in store for tonight's special program. We will be talking to priests, the head of the Catholic League, and of course, you at home. If you, like me, have a vested interest in the future of the church and old passionate positions on its future, I invite you to keep watching. Now this program, it may even challenge some of those beliefs. We take you inside the day-to-day -day lives of some New York City nuns. These nuns, part of the same group being condemned by the church for being, as I said, radical feminists. They're nuns who care for the moms and their babies in prison. Now, despite their vows to never marry or carry children, these nuns know exactly what motherhood is all about because through their work, they end up, in some cases, becoming the mothers for these children as well. It's really a remarkable story. But before we get into any of that, let's take a look at how we got here in the first place. The Catholic Church today, many would say, is in a state of profound transition. Though the sacraments, they remain unchanged, what has changed dramatically are the numbers. Fewer and fewer people are in the pews each week, while the number of ordained clergy and women religious continue to sharply decline. I think it's falling of its own weight because of its of its, its excessive uh, hierarchical nature because it, it doesn't listen to the people. I strongly believe in free will and, and I strongly believe in a woman's choice. We're not here to make everybody Catholic <laughs> or everybody a nun. <laughs> That's counterproductive and counter gospel in my book. Polling complete in the last decade by the Center for Applied Research in the Postulate showed that the number of U.S. adult Catholics who attended Mass once a week is consistent but low. Just 22% report going to Mass every Sunday. Even more daunting is this statistic, published last month, showing that confidence in the Catholic Church is at an all-time low. Just 46% of U.S. Catholics, slightly less than half, have any confidence in the Church. It follows a long-term decline in confidence in religion since the 1970s. Certainly we live in a secular age. Uh, we live in an age of relativism where everybody has their own truth. Uh, and what the church needs to do is continue to proclaim once again to a new generation. It's not so much coming up with, uh, with nifty patterns or plans, but it's really about how do we stay faithful to the message we've received in a way that's gonna connect with people today. Father Luke Sweeney is the outgoing director of vocations for the Archdiocese of New York at St. Joe's Seminary. Vocations directors, they serve at the pleasure of the Archbishop for any length of time. Father Sweeney has served for six years. He says numbers don't tell the whole story, suggesting that this year's ordination 
of one priest, one single priest, might be a touchy subject. Father Sweeney says otherwise. I've never received any pressure from the top to say, why didn't you get, you know, 100 guys in a year or something like that. Uh, we ordained one this past year. And we knew it would be coming because we took a program that was a minimum of five years and we expanded it to six years. So we gave them extra training. And in doing so, we lost a class that went there. God willing, next year we'll ordain seven men to the priesthood. Nearly 50 years after the rise of Vatican II, which was intended to open the church to the modern world and all its issues, some say the church is still resistant to dealing with signs of the times. But a decline in confidence does not necessarily mean the people are turning their backs on God. 90% of Americans say they actually do believe in God, and that number has been holding steady since the 70s. So it's not a problem of faith, it's a problem for the institution. A problem made much worse by charges of child molestation by Catholic priests and cover-ups by some higher-ups in the church. The priest sex abuse scandal, it has cost the Catholic Church an estimated $2.6 billion and created a ripple effect that no one had anticipated, deficits in operating budgets of Catholic schools. It's not the official reason that archdioceses give for school closings, but last year alone, the Archdiocese of New York had to close 27 Catholic schools from Staten Island to the Mid-Hudson Valley, displacing close to 4,000 students. It just makes sense to do a little pruning so that the overall school system can continue to be strong. When news broke last January that Highland St. Augustine School would close in June, parents said they were fed up and left without options. Well, I'm not going to send my child across the river and worry about getting on the bus. Basically, he won't be going to Catholic school anymore. Right now, I'm not sure which school to put them in. I might try out public and see how that goes. Today, the church is divided sharply between a progressive faction hoping for change and reform and conservative traditionalists who want to see the church return to more narrow fundamentals. Church scholars say the divide, it's been building for decades and is evident through the current power struggle between both the nuns and the Vatican. This comes at a pivotal time here. This week, the country's largest group of nuns, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, are meeting in St. Louis, right in fact as we speak, deciding whether or not they will bow to the church's reprimand or even possibly form a new organization independent of the Vatican control. Now, when we come back, our reporter Kim Langle, she'll join us to explain the significance of that Vatican report, and then we'll meet up with some New York City nuns, and you can judge for yourself, if the work they're doing deserves rebuke or praise from the church. And as always, we bring you into our conversation in tonight's program, certainly calls for it. Tell us what you think. Please go to our Facebook page and find the special Catholic Church at a Crossroads tab and share your thoughts and feelings on the subject. Much more to come here this hour, so please, everyone, stay with us. And welcome back, everyone. We are talking about this hour, challenges facing the Catholic Church. Now, it's a topic that's obviously very personal to me and so many of you out in the audience. And I'm expecting, like myself, many of you were stunned here to learn that the Vatican is going after a part of its own. And I'm talking about that now infamous Vatican report that was released in April condemning the country's largest group of nuns. The Leadership Conference of Women Religious. It's an umbrella group that represents more than 45,000 nuns all across the United States. The group, organized in the 1950s under encouragement from the Vatican, and the nuns made it their mission to promote social justice. But in 2008, the Vatican quietly began a sweeping investigation that found, quote, serious doctrinal problems among the nuns. An eight-page report from the Vatican said, the LCWR had challenged church teaching on homosexuality and the male-only priesthood, among other things. It also accused the nuns of pushing radical feminist themes. Now, after six weeks of deliberations, the group, it finally broke its silence and said the Vatican's accusations were, quote, unsubstantiated. Now, for much more on the perspective of the nuns, our reporter Kim Langle has spent the past couple of weeks here with a group of nuns, and she's here to report 
on what she experienced firsthand. Yeah, that's right, Rich. Well, the sisters we met believe in redemption and a right to a second chance in life no matter what mistakes you've made. They're nuns who care for new moms and babies in prison, and when their sentences finish, the nuns are there to care for them and help them turn their lives around. Despite the vows to never marry or carry children, these nuns know exactly what motherhood is all about because through their work, they end up becoming moms too. 11-month-old baby Darje Williams will be spending the first year of his life in prison. Rain Wilkerson has already been in lockup for over a year. Her mom, 27-year-old Anel Ravel, was sentenced to eight years for selling drugs. The babies don't know that they're in jail. She knows her mother, and um, the kids are like her siblings. They just play together. 39-year-old Kenesha Williams is serving a two-and-a-half-year sentence for attempted robbery. This is not my first time arrested or being in jail. My first arrest, I lost my first son. He's 21 years old. And now I have this baby. I, I found out I was pregnant when I got a, a, you know, arrested. I was five-and-a-half months pregnant. And um, I was very happy, you know, excited about the new baby and new start. Both Kenesha and Anel have that in common, both experiencing motherhood for the second time, both in prison, and both hoping to break the cycle. The women are raising their babies in New York's Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, home to the country's oldest prison nursery, with a crib right there in the cell. Hi, Tajé. And weekly visits from this woman, Sister Eileen Trainer. As a Sister of Mercy, our special concern is to serve the economically poor, especially women and children. So it's, it's like tongue and groove, the fit between the Sisters of Mercy and the goal of our children. Our Children is headquartered in the Long Island City section of Queens. Run by four nuns, it's a nonprofit that houses formerly incarcerated moms and their kids. It helps them turn their lives around. The four sisters are not the kind of nuns you'd imagine when you hear the word. There are nuns who live in cloistered solitude, but these sisters aren't any of them. And through their work with women, they give new meaning to the term mother superior. I have thousands of children. In terms of my vow of celibacy, it frees me to be a mother, not only to the children, but also to the mothers. I've often said, even though I've never had any child, that I've mothered many. In the past 26 years, Our Children has helped more than 2,000 female inmates reunite with their children and transition back into everyday life. Stretched over several blocks in Queens, Our Children provides free housing and daycare. Go build a tower. Yeah. Thrift stores where former inmates can work and shop and a job placement center where women can work on their resumes. Hi, Sister Eileen. Sister Eileen says every Thursday when she visits the women of Bedford Prison, she brings a new unused tablet. Every time she leaves, the tablet is full, full with lists of things women need help with, calling attorneys, family members, getting in touch with foster care agencies, and supporting them through court dates. The sisters are so dedicated, they often become temporary guardians to the children who can't stay at the prison. The temporary release of uh, temporary um, custody papers, when do I sign those? I'm nervous now because he's getting ready to go. He's leaving because um, you, you can stay in this program provided, 18 months provided you're going home within that time. I'm not going home within eight, within, within that 18, <laughs> 18 months time, so he has to go home and they're going to take him from me. I think it's really important that you get the associate and keep going afterwards. I know I drive her crazy because I ask her a million questions. Um, I do because I'm nervous. I think it's a blessing, you know, that they created a program like that. There's services that they offer. There's no program like it. The sisters say they encourage the women to count their blessings. It's in that same spirit that our children was named. It stresses how the lives of children with moms in prison are dedicated by ours. It's the hour that the mother was arrested, the hour that 
the visit takes place in the prison and the hour that the mother is released from prison. Kanisha's baby, Darje, is going to be living at Our Children until his mom is released in 2013. He'll be cared for by the nuns and the staff, and they'll bring him to Bedford for regular visits. Anel and her baby will be moving into one of the five Our Children homes when her sentence is complete in October. Rich. All right, Kim, thank you very much. Now, that actually is only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to this story. Now, when we come back, we'll go deeper into the lives of these nuns, and you'll meet two former inmates who say these nuns are the real deal. Now, in the meantime, please communicate to us here. You can send us uh, your comments in a variety of ways. You can send me a tweet about our program at Rich French Live, or you can go to our Facebook page and answer our question. And here it is, a call to Catholics. What do you believe is the biggest challenge now facing the church? Welcome back to our special report. Now, we've been telling you about a certain group of nuns, the country's largest group, in fact, that are facing harsh criticism from the Vatican for being disloyal to the church. Now, those, the Vatican's own words. Let's try and put this in some context for a sec. With some of the other, really, seismic challenges that the Catholic Church is facing, we'll get into those over the balance of this hour, Pope Paul VI in 1968 wrote that contraception is wrong. Many Catholics then, as well as now, disagree. 82% of U.S. Catholics say birth control is morally acceptable, and that's according to a Gallup poll taken just this May. So Catholics are obviously choosing to disagree, yet continue to show up, at least in some numbers, on Sunday mornings. And then there's a lot of other issues that we're seeing Catholics breaking with the church. Well, the tension between the nuns and the Vatican is yet another example, and it served as an inspiration in many ways for us to produce this series. Now, I want to bring our reporter Kim Lengel back in, and as I said, Kim spent weeks here uh, with this group of nuns, and you got to see both what they do and the impact of their work. That's right. So we're going to head back to Long Island City in Queens. For these nuns, their main goal is to make sure the women don't end up back behind bars. As you'll see, their style may be unconventional, but they're getting results. The stories have made them legends in the eyes of the women they've saved. Some girls leave. They leave their kids. They go back out into the streets smoking crack doing drugs. And here are these nuns, and they go looking for them. They go knocking on their doors in the projects where, where there's drug dealers and, 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 you know, a bunch of junkies walking around and crackheads. And here are these nuns walking around with a picture. Have you seen this girl? We have her children. Can you please tell her to come home? Like, that's, you don't see nuns doing that. You would never think, you know, so when I seen that, for like, when I seen that for the first time, I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Jody and Carolyn are two formerly incarcerated moms living at Our Children. They could have returned to the streets that once cultivated their drug addictions, but both were afraid of being sucked back in. Living here, you just know what you need to do to make a better change in life, and they constantly reinforcing it. Love makes a difference to, you know, be friendly, and they prepare you for the world. world. If you knew me years ago, like seven years ago, you wouldn't believe that I was the same person today. Both moms live with their kids in one of six housing units operated by the nuns. They manage on a budget of $2.8 million, money generated by donations, grants, and the thrift store. Sister Tiza Fitzgerald. I'm the executive director. <laughs> Means I signed the checks. <laughs> Sister Tiza is like no other. It's been said she brings a little piece of heaven down to earth. When people come out of prison, they don't come out saying, gee, you know, I'm really going to mess up or uh, I want to go back. They come out with great hopes. And I think it's our responsibility, and I see it as my responsibility and my commitment to help nourish that hope. Sister Tiza says that eight out of 10 women who enter her program obtain a steady job and transition back into society. Compare that to the statewide recidivism rate. Left on their own, 58% of female prisoners will be rearrested within three years of release. I could probably just fill the walls of this entire building. Surrounded by dozens of smiling children and their mothers, Sister Tiza says she lives for each and every one of them. When you get to know them and you get comfortable, it's just like you're sitting here talking to one of us, 
you can talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to judge you. They'll pray for you. Right. <laughs> They'll and say, dear you God, you need help. Oh, let me say a prayer. But, you know, it's, it's all right. They're not going to, they don't judge you. The woman also said one of the things they appreciated most about living with the nuns is that they didn't push religion down their throat. If you came in believing in another religion, you could actually leave believing in that same religion. Rich. All right. Now, we mentioned the significance of this week. This group is going to be in St. Louis, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So the nuns are really upset because they consider this to be a, quote, hostile takeover. And the Vatican wants to put three bishops in charge of these nuns to oversee everything they read, write, and talk about in their general assemblies. And the nuns are deciding whether or not they're going to bow to that reprimand. They have six options laid out. They may take one of the six, or they may decide, we want to be independent of the Vatican and create their own organization. It's something uh, for many people who grew up around it, just inconceivable to see this kind of potential schism here between nuns and the Catholic Church. All right, thank you very much, Kim. When we come back, everyone, we're going to be talking to two priests who have very unique views about the church. They are a flock of a different breed, and you may be surprised to find out what they are doing. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special report. I want you to think for a second about the last time you went to Mass and how many people were in attendance. Then think back 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think you see where I'm going with this. It's not just the parishioners that seem to be in shorter supply these days. Priests and women religious, they're a diminishing breed as well. The number of priests skyrocketed from about 27,000 in 1930 to 58,000 in 1965 in the States after Vatican II. More recently, that number, it has dropped to just 40,000. And there's also a similar trend facing women religious. In 1965, just under 200,000 women in the U.S. had joined religious orders. More recently, that number has shrunk to just 55,000. You may have also noticed from our previous two stories on nuns that these nuns, they're certainly not getting any younger. The average age of women religious is 68. And get this, there are more women religious over the age of 90 than under the age of 30. So we asked ourselves, what is it about the Catholic vocations that people are no longer flocking to? Well, to answer that question, we will be joined on set by three priests with their perspective. And also, Kim Lengel went out looking for a perspective from someone who was once a priest of the Catholic Church, but now ministers outside of it. And she's here now to tell us more. It's very interesting. And in some ways with this story, I got more than I bargained for because the answers were deeply emotional and complicated. We sought to find two ex-priests to find out what led the, to their calling into the priesthood and then out of the priesthood. The parish of Reverend Rich Hasselback in West Nyack, New York, is a small but close-knit group. Peace. During the Mass, Father Rich leaves the altar to offer parishioners the sign of peace. You know, for years my ministry was, and still remains, uh, to, to, to sort of Catholics who fall through the Catholic cracks. You know, people who have in one way or another um, been disillusioned or disenfranchised by the institutional church. And there are a lot of them. Father Rich's so-called specialization is not by accident. At 24, Father Rich was ordained a Franciscan priest. About two years later, he began having serious doubts. He says he suffered alone for a long time, wondering if he made the right decision. The lifestyle of the Catholic priest was dis would lead to dysfunctionality, at least for me. Uh, that I, I would be unable to live without real human love in my life. Um, and I, as I looked around, I saw a lot, of, a lot of human wreckage among the priesthood, a lot of guys who were you know, drinking too much or, 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 or getting into lifestyles that were just not terribly healthy. The structured church that I belonged to didn't have a listening ear. It, it was more a church that had its rules, it made its statements, and the but dealing with the actual moment of people's lives was, was missing. For Father Noel Clark, the journey out of the Roman Catholic priesthood began much later in life than Father Rich. Father Clark had already spent 40 years of his life dedicated to serving Irish immigrants in London. He came to New York City to work as an immigrant chaplain. 
That's when he wondered if he was being called to something else. The first thing I, I found was the the rigid mentality of the clergy, uh, not necessarily caring for the total person. Where love is, God is, and God is creating. Today, both priests preach and perform under the umbrella organization City Ministries. City standing for celibacy is the issue. Both of us had the brakes on for a long time, you know, denial of feelings, because there was that arm's length between us. And uh, I, uh, growing up Roman Catholic, I had great respect for the priesthood. And so I didn't think about him in, as a man. I thought of him as the priest. That's one of the uh, criticisms of the priestly church is, is the priests minister today say to marry people and they haven't a clue what they're talking about because they don't have that intimate experience. Both priests say they've married hundreds of couples since leaving the Roman Catholic Church but in the eyes of Rome those marriages are considered illicit and not sacramental. Neither priest seems to care. I mean the church and I, and I, I respect it and I'm not angry at it at all uh, but the church is uh, in protecting its own prerogatives is engaging in what I would consider dangerous hubris because it's, it, it does not have its hand on the spigot of God's love. Yeah. God is too big to be controlled for, by for any institution. Both priests are recognized ministers in good standing with the International Council of Community Churches and the marriages they perform are legal in the eyes of the state but not necessarily to Rome. Rich. Absolutely. All right, Kim, thank you very much. Now, coming up, everyone, we're going to be hearing from the head of the Catholic League, and we're also going to be talking to some active priests, as I mentioned, about challenges they face in their own parish and the direction they see and hope the church follows. Now, in the meantime, please make your opinions heard and tell us what you think. Just go to our Facebook page and find the special Catholic church at a crossroads tab and share your own thoughts and feelings on the subject. Still much more to come, so please stay with us. Welcome back. You're about to see my interview with one of the more high-profile voices in the Catholic Church, and that's Catholic League President Bill Donahue. Now, his conservative positions have been well documented for decades, and while Bill and I may disagree on many of them, his investment in the church is unquestioned, and we both share common hope that the church returns to better days. Here's a portion of that interview. When we take stock as the laity of our church, um, how would you assess the health of it right now? Well, I've seen it when it's a lot better, that's for certain. Uh, there's no question about it. The heyday of Catholicism in America, as every historian agrees, was the 1950s. And of course, our culture went into certain kinds of convulsions in the 1960s, a much more secular thrust, which is still with us today. Uh, the Catholic Church has had, of course, a rough go of it, didn't it, with the, uh, the scandal that broke loose uh, actually in the 60s and 70s, quite frankly, and the early 80s. We didn't really come to fruition in terms of the news stories until about 10 years ago, but that is largely behind us. Um, so I think we're in some still tr troubled waters, but uh, there, are, there are some positive signs as well. I mean, there is a hunger and a thirst for matters spiritual. So I still think that uh, Catholicism has a strong role to play uh, in our society, particularly in these troubled times. When we talk about priests, I know a lot of people, and I'm sure you do, that not only left the order, but never joined the order because they couldn't get married. We used to let priests get married until the 12th century. Also, there's loopholes. Guys can join the Catholic Church from the Greek Orthodox Church with a family, and with a wife and a family. They're welcome with open arms. And there's other exceptions also. To me, I think it's not modernizing, but we did it before. If we did it before, why won't we let, to have our church survive, more priests that are more relatable to the laity and let these guys get married? It doesn't take away from their ability to lead a church. Uh, you know, when Cardinal Egan was stepping down from being the Archbishop of New York, he came out and said, maybe we, we should reconsider uh, the whole idea of celibacy. After all, celibacy is a discipline. That is to say, it's a man-made stricture or rule of the Catholic Church, uh, which they can, of course, change. And maybe, in fact, the time has come to change. The only thing I would say is this. If we think that that's going to bring more priests in, Consider the fact, again, that the mainline Protestant denominations, they all allow married priests 
So if, if celibacy is a problem, how does one explain the fact that they're losing uh, their clergy much faster than we are? So that I think it's more complicated than even that. Let's talk about the sisters because in putting this together, we've spoken to more than a dozen sisters in different orders. And I got to tell you, um, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Uh, mine as good as yours. But we've spent, when we put money into the operatory plates, I don't know about you, I didn't know that my money was going for secret payoffs here um, in the abuse scandal. And while I don't want to uh, spend this program and this time here talking about, obviously, a painful chapter in the church, for the Vatican to come down on nuns who are doing some of the most thankless work, working with the most vulnerable in this society, for them to go after this population, after everything that went on, aiding and abetting pedophiles for crying out loud. I got to tell you, it gets me right here. These women, these older women, don't ask for a penny. And because they're dressed and because they're not, their obeyance isn't in line, is this really who we ought to be going after right now? Nuns? You don't have a problem with that, Bill, to me? I mean, I can't tell you the amount of people, the unanimity here of people say, are you crazy? Every nun that I know, first of all, is a tough, it's a tough you-know-what. And second of all, they're the best of who we are as a church. And we're going after them. See, I don't agree with your interpretation. I'm glad the Vatican is having an inquiry. No one's losing any license to teach. When we have nuns who are pro-abortion and who sign in on, on full-page ads in the New York Times that they're pro-abortion and the Catholic Church is wrong, that they've gone beyond Jesus, that they're into uh, Buddhist uh, spirituality and the like, these are people who have actually left the reservation, and I, and I as a Catholic do not want to fund nuns who have lost their faith altogether. I don't think we should be sucked in by some radicals who have obviously lost their moorings in the Catholic Church. And at the same time, I will say... I don't want to be misunderstood. Most nuns have served this country and the Catholic Church uh, so well. I, I am extremely proud of them. But I am also, my heart goes out to those nuns and those ex-nuns who have talked to me for decades about how come nobody ever speaks up for them. I know nuns who have gone back into habit and they are treated as a pariah, as dirt by the nuns who, have, who are involved in their kind of sister polyester retire. No, there's a real problem there, and that's why Catholics complain to the Vatican, and finally the Vatican is looking at it. Here's where I'm concerned. Outgoing priest of my kids' parochial school says, um, listen, if you want your kids to have a Catholic education, you're going to have to fight for it because it's frankly vanishing. And the amount of schools that are shuttering their doors, Bill, um, you know, if you care and love, and love the faith, let alone the church here, it should scare everybody. There's a lot of reasons as to why, but do you see it very conceivably here? Forget about the Catholic hospitals. Just deal with the church, uh, just deal with the parochial schools. We could be looking 20 years from now. Um, we'll be lucky if we find a few in every district for crying out loud. Well, here we agree 100%. And I taught in uh, Spanish Harlem in a very rough neighborhood of black and Puerto Rican kids. I loved them. It was, they treated me wonderfully, and the people in the neighborhood were wonderful. That was back in the 1970s. I've seen firsthand what the Catholic Church and the Catholic schools can do in the inner city ghetto. And uh, it is a shame that the Catholic Church has not put more money into having these schools survive. The school that I taught in was closed here about ten year, about maybe seven or eight years ago up in Spanish Harlem. Those are the places where we've done the God's missionary work, and we should keep them open at all cost. Uh, unfortunately, for all kinds of reasons, some of them are legitimate, others are not so legitimate, and you uh, implied uh, as such, I think, in your previous comments, too much money being paid out for the stupid decisions and morally bankrupt decisions that were made by some people uh, in the past. But no, we've got to have Catholic education, particularly at the elementary and secondary level. Otherwise, we will lose a whole generation. We're, I'm with you on that 100%, Richard. Finally, you hopeful here, Bill? I mean, I know we're supposed to be optimistic, but we're also, uh, uh, you know, uh, by definition, if we're Catholics, we get the guilt and we get jaded. That said, you got any sense that 20 years from now, the church is in a better place than it is now, or do you think the trend continues? No, I think, I think our worst days are behind us. I think we've learned some of the some hard lessons, and I think that there'll be a lot of uh, good changes going forward. Quite frankly, uh, Richard, if I wasn't optimistic about the future, what ambition would I have to get out of bed in the morning 
and go to work as the president of the Catholic League. It's because I think that we can overcome a lot of the problems, some of which are self-generated, I'm the first one to admit. And, and, there's a, and there's an animus in our society, though, I think, toward organized religion in general. I think that we, can, we have to make some changes, but I'm confident about the future in the long run. Otherwise, I say, I couldn't do this job. You can see my full-length interview with Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic League, if you go to our Facebook page. And while you're there, please tell us how you feel about the Catholic Church right now, and please answer our question. And it's a call to Catholics. What is the biggest challenge facing our church? Now, when we come back, we invited three priests to our studio to talk about a host of issues. Here's what they sounded off. That's coming up next. churches as important as the bishops and the leadership. They don't really want to dialogue with us most of the time, is the way I feel. And so I feel that we are, uh, that the church is in serious problems, especially in the United States. I am very disappointed that the reforms of Vatican II seem to be being taken away from us. And I felt that that was such an exciting time in the church, a very important time for my own growth. Welcome back. Voices of the Laity, that's just a sampling of RFL viewers talking about how the church here is, as we said, really at a crossroads and which direction they think the church ought to take. It's also the topic of our show this evening. Now it's time to hear from some active priests. We recently invited three prominent priests from our region to a studio for our wide-ranging roundtable discussion about those challenges. Here now is the conversation. What's the health right now of the Catholic Church? Father, I'll start with you. Here in the United States, in comparison with where we were, let's take the year 1960 as a benchmark, statistically we're in trouble. Uh, we have lost uh, mass attendance, uh, sacramental participation, baptisms, marriages. Uh, the number of priests has declined precipitously, and the number of seminarians is down. Uh, so we have to face the reality that the church, which is still very important and very vibrant in the U.S. in so many ways, uh, is not at the level which it was at uh, 50 years ago. You so guys have known each other for a while now, haven't mm -hmm. you? Oh, yes. Sure. Oh, yeah. When you guys were in the seminary, um, you had a, a class of 12, do I have it right? No, I was 12. I he had was 20. He was ahead of 20. He was ahead of me. Same, same place right now. Yeah. The right. last seminary that's left, sure. class of one. It's not an easy life from the point of view of, of many things. On the other hand, if you live it well, it becomes quite easy in the sense that you enjoy it, you find great joy in it. By the way, if you look at some of the other Protestant groups and the Jewish groups, they have the same problem with getting ministers. And for me, baptizing kids, giving First Communion to kids is very rewarding. And I say, well, it'd be nice to be married to a family. I said, no, Jesus and the apostles, I'm following their footsteps. Do you think, though, if you did want to get married, you'd be any less of a priest? Well, I couldn't, it wouldn't happen, number one, and I'm, <laughs> I don't feel that way uh, because I knew I freely gave it up, you know. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest countercultural indicators in the Catholic Church, celibacy of the clergy. Yep. Since sex has become the center of cultural expression, priests who avoid sex for the love of God are somehow viewed as threats, and uh, it's very true. On the other hand, well, most if people... If somebody says that, mm -hmm. I... I I would take issue with them because, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, what always bothered me most about the abuse scandal was it allowed the vast, vast majority of priests who do thankless work that I don't think the majority of the population knows about, takes the vow of poverty and everything else, and to let them get painted with the same broad brush. And I thought that mm -hmm. was one of the many tragedies outside, obviously, of the victims. Agreed. <clears throat> if we had been done due diligence and we had been very strict uh, oversight, certainly at the Episcopal level, meaning the bishops, um, Nobody would have this vast lack of confidence and trust that has gotten to this point. So, you know, the first uh, black eye was the fact that those who had oversight over these dioceses, you know, um, let this go by. And certainly when you see what's going on, uh, you can look at the Philadelphia case, yep. et cetera. Um, it's going to be an issue that's not going to go away. Agreed. And, you know, the shock when I discovered that there were these thousands of cases of priests who were being shuffled around from parishes to parishes, bishops not disciplining them, a false notion of forgiveness and all. I was shocked and I said I never knew this existed. I think that's what really hit most people. They didn't think it was this widespread and they didn't think that the bishops wouldn't discipline them. That was good, that shock, because it forced the bishops to change their way of action. 
But ultimately, you know, the Vatican also got into the act and, and they put new laws in and they said to bishops, you've got to be more serious. If we, get, if we stop having headlines of priests being arrested, I think the people's trust is going to come back. As more and more schools close down, what will the consequence be? Um, just take this archdiocese. What's it going to be long term? Is that one of the consequences um, of the abuse scandal that people don't realize? The only answer is money. I hate to say it because it's true. I run a parish. It's also a small business in the sense of I have employees and I have uh, utility costs and I have building maintenance. Uh, if we had unlimited funds, we could have par parochial schools in every single parish. We could have adequately trained teachers and a, and a great uh, experience. We don't have that. The system, as you may remember, was based on contributed services yep. from nuns. So therefore, the operating expenses were not as high as they became with uh, salary teachers. Plus, when you had large mass attendance in the past, uh, collections of parishes were greater. You could support the schools. Uh, money is, you know, temporalities, we call it in the church. Money is extremely important. I was meeting a pastor from Texas the other day. Uh, he takes in about twenty to thirty thousand dollars a week in his parish in the collections. Not they bad. almost fell over. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, good. why he's, he's got thousands of people coming to mass. Where there is faith lived, money is uh, available. But I, I would grant you that. I mean, you put your finger on something which is neuralgic, unfortunately, in the church. In the church, the Catholic Church now. We, I would point it very bluntly, we no longer have a model of Catholic schooling that works. We have individual Catholic schools that work, and we will always have some individual Catholic schools. We do not have a model that works anymore. And we, it's going to be very difficult to identify how to move forward so that we get um, more face time with a greater number of students. Y you may not know this, only 12% of all Catholic children are now educated in Catholic schools. Uh, so that, and that number is going to go, it, it's not falling precipitously, but it's moving smaller. You know, it'll go to 10, 9, 8 on the thing. So you're right. Now to see our entire conversation with those priests, that round table, you can go to our Facebook page and see that. And while you're there at facebook.com slash Richard French Live, tell us what you think, your opinions here, and I especially like to hear from you, the lady, about the Catholic Church being at a crossroads. And as, as we asked our guests the directions you'd like to see it take. All right, when we come back, I'll have some final thoughts, so please stay with us. An outgoing principal of a parochial school recently told myself and an assembled group of parents that we would have to fight for our school and schools like it in the future. In many ways, he might as well have been talking about our church. Now, I believe the stakes cannot be exaggerated and the challenges more pronounced, but neither do I think they're insurmountable. My church has been beaten up enough this past decade or so, and my intent this hour wasn't to pile on. But two of the painful truths that came out of the abuse scandal was that blind belief in the wisdom of the powers that be was both misplaced and that the laity was too often spoken to and not listened to. Now we vowed then that we would forevermore be heard and I believe if we love our church and want to see it sustain and prosper, we the laity must speak up and be counted. We do face a crisis, but unlike some, I don't believe it's a crisis of faith, but rather a crisis of confidence. Now, if this hour accomplished anything, I hope, it at least began a dialogue that promises to be possibly contentious, but both critical to returning people to the pews. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight, and please keep your comments coming. We'll see you back here tomorrow evening. Till then, have a great night.